in order to truly understand a piece of literature, you have to understand the time period from which the piece of literature came. Um, literature is not written in isolation. It's a real product of a real time period. It's reflective of the culture out of which it came, and it reflects the culture out of which it came. So it's important that we know what the situation was around the time that Charlotte Perkins Gilman wrote The Yellow Wallpaper. And so I want to spend a little bit of time here talking about women and women writers at the turn of the 20th century. So as we're moving from the 1900, the 1800s into the 1900s. Now, there was an idea in culture called the ideal Victorian woman. In other words, what a woman should be. What was the role of women in society? This was the question that people asked. Um, what is she supposed to do? What are the roles that women can have? The work they can fulfill? Where is their position? And this was a question that began to be discussed at the end of the Victorian period. Now the Victorian period lasted from around 1830 to 1901 and it really is centered about the same time as the reign of Queen Victoria in England. Queen Victoria reigned from 1837 to 1901. So um, this is sort of the time period that we're talking about here with the yellow wallpaper. Now Queen Victoria supported education for women but interestingly enough opposed their right to vote calling it the, that push for women to vote this mad folly. So she thought it was ridiculous in other words that women would even be trying to get the right to vote. This next quote, or it was written, it was, it was, it's part of a letter that Queen Victoria wrote to her daughter shortly after her daughter married in 1858. And it gives you a little indication of what the cultural norms and attitudes were about women. And she writes to her daughter that there is great happiness in devoting oneself to another who is worthy of one's affection. Still men are very selfish and the woman's devotion is always one of submission, which makes our poor sex so very unenviable. This you will feel hereafter, meaning hereafter that you get married, I know, though it cannot be otherwise as God has willed it so. So in other words, she's telling her daughter um, the role of women, uh, the role of woman in a marriage, the role of woman in life is to be one of submission. And even though that I don't necessarily like that, it's God's will. So that's a pretty strong statement about the role of women um, in the culture at this period of time. Now, this belief in the God-given natural role of women led to the notion of the angel in the house. Women were to be valued for their tenderness, understanding, unworldliness, innocence, domestic affection, and submissiveness. So these were the values, the characteristics that a woman was to have. So women almost became objects to be worshipped, which ironically became an obstacle to them achieving any change in status. So they were sort of stuck in this angel in the house um, role. Not surprisingly, by the end of the 19th century, um, there was a pushback against this Victorian angel in the house. And she came, the pushback took on the embodiment of the term the new woman, that the new woman was going to change. And this was actually a term coined then, new woman, not, not now. And this was a pushback against the Victorian notions of ideal womanhood. The new woman was primarily middle class, she rejected traditional roles and strove for equality with men. And she sought to break this angel whore dichotomy. Um, so either you're an angel in the house, you're the perfect Victorian woman, or you're a slut. She sought to break that dichotomy and show that there were many shades of gray and celebrate female desire as a creative force, as a positive creative force. So, not surprisingly, this new woman ideal was picked up by many women writers of the time period. And we see this emerge a lot 
in sh the short story. Most Victorian novels were huge. There were three volumes at least because they were serialized in magazines. And so the more you wrote, the more you got paid. So they were hugely long. And they uh, ended either in the heroines getting married or dying. So those are the two trajectories of a classic Victorian novel for the heroine. And so many women writers pushed back against that using the genre of the short story. The short story became popular in the 80s and 90s and allowed women writers more flexibility in form and plot and freed them from the marriage or death outcomes of the vic typical Victorian novel. So we're going to read a short story um, it's published during this time period that is dealing with some of these new, uh, new woman issues and the old Victorian models as well. So these women writers are trying to rewrite the myths of the culture that they felt like denigrated womanhood. And they're going to focus on female sexuality and actual marital discontent. So instead of a woman's trajectory having to be marriage or death, they begin exploring some different options for women. But they did so understanding that it wasn't an easy solution to the problem, that there were dangers involved with this, um, with this, with broadening the roles for women. And so they write with that sensitivity and that understanding, uh, but they never turned back. So they kept pushing and pushing um, for the new woman and these new ideals to take root in the culture. I want to give you a little timeline so we can situate this short story we're going to read and then the, a play later on within this turn of the century world. In 1882 in England, the Married Women's Property Act was finally passed and this allowed women to keep their property once they got married. Before this time, once a woman was married, all of her property became that of her husband's and she virtually was no longer a legal entity. So that was reversed in 1882. In the U.S. in 1890, Wyoming became the first state to grant women the vote. So if you could vote for state and local elections in Wyoming if you were a woman, but you could not vote for national elections at that point. So you see, 1892, the yellow wallpaper, um, this first story we're going to read. So you can kind of see where it is positioned. Um, Trifles we'll read later. It's 1916. It was later rewritten as a short story in 1917. And then finally in 18, women get the vote in England, and in 1920, we get the vote in the United States. So, not surprisingly then, there was a cultural reaction to this idea of the new woman. The attempt to expand and educate women, um, there was pushback from the culture. And this new woman was constructed in popular culture as a threat to the social structure and to the human race in general. Education and traditionally masculine pursuits were seen as damaging to women's reproductive abilities. So that if you strove to work or to educate yourself, then that was going to affect your ability to have children. So this was seriously believed. Um, and the new woman was accused of hating children, being a lesbian, dressing inappropriately, and otherwise undermining Victorian ideals of womanhood. All right, this is a quotation by a very prominent physician um, in 1874. His name is Henry Maudsley. And this is his writing on what will happen to a woman who um, seeks to work and to be educated. Um, they say it would be an ill thing if it would so happen that we got the advantages of a quantity of female intellectual work and the price of a puny, enfeebled, and sickly race of people. So in other words, like I said, if women work and if they're educated, it's, they're going to have problems reproducing and having healthy children. The second one is by a man named Charles Harper in 1894. He actually went as far as to claim that the new woman would lead to the extinction of the human race. That nature will be revenged upon her offspring. So there would be great, great difficulties. 
Um, Charles Harper actually wrote an entire book called The Revolted Woman. Um, and in it, um, he goes all the way back to Eve and blames women for everything that's wrong in the world, calls her an irresponsible creature who cannot reason or follow an argument to its just conclusion. And he says, if mankind is to be led by the new woman, is she, first of all, sure of the path? So he goes on to slam the new woman, the emancipated woman, as he calls it, talking about her dress, um, her language, that she's smoking, wearing trousers, um, that she's forgetting that the goal of women is to submit, and on and on and on and on. So in addition to Mr. Harper and other writers that were very similar to him, we have some visual representations in the culture of um, how horrible it was to be this new woman. So as the culture was trying to push back and prevent women from undertaking new roles. This series of illustrations were from the magazine Punch. Um, this first one is from a Punch magazine in 1892, the same year the yellow wallpaper was um, published. And it's called A Weary, A Weary. And it's a commentary upon women's inability to undertake serious education. Many question whether women could emotionally and physically handle the rigors of education. There were also concerns that women's education would increase their masculinity and make them less attractive for marriage. So in this print, um, there is a clear distinction between the conception of the educated woman who is down here and the ideal um, Victorian woman who is up here. Um, this educated woman, you can tell, is a weary, a weary. She looks tired from all her educational pursuits. Um, her knowledge places her mind and body in distress. She clearly doesn't look good. Her physical development appears stunted. Um, her head is um, a lot um, larger than her little body. And there's just this whole notion of if you study, you're going to shrink away. Um, the younger woman, in contrast, who's actually doing her duty and serving the man T, um, is very um, beautiful. She is domesticated. She is healthy. And her appearance and the contrast in appearances here is supposed to prove that the proper place for women in this era was supposed to be in the home. So there you have one print. And then here are a couple of more. And these were 1865 and 1866, so a little bit earlier. And they depict the idealized Victorian wo woman as mother and wife. Um, a man's home was the castle where everything should work according to his desires. And so in this space, the wife, the angel of the house, was untainted by troubles from the outside. In fact, she was so untainted that she's just merely reclining. She has no other problems. She is physically and emotionally unfit to take on the rigors of life, so here she is resting. Um, these are typical of Punch's representations of women in the domestic setting. Both women are inactive. They have very youthful and simple features, and these were you know, ideals of the quintessential Victorian woman. In Innocence, down here, the mother's attention is focused on her daughter. She's got this serene expression on her face. Doesn't appear to have any concerns. Up here in Groundless Alarm, she's looking at her husband who's just announced he's going to go out for the evening. Even though she is awake and speaking to him, she actually looks unconscious. Um, and in the dialogue below, the woman is described as an affectionate wife. Um, she is clearly not worrying about anything. Um, her only concern is the home, and she can't worry about anything beyond that. The new woman fought the confining definition of women as strictly wives and mothers, and Punch 
is responding negatively here. Um, and then the last one, this is the new woman being viewed by many as turning women into men and then destroying marriage. And so here we have a newly married attractive woman right here and this older female intellect. Um, and so she looks, this younger woman looks like she's bowing at the feet of the older woman. Um, she's got this great little gentle expression. But this woman up here who represents the new school of female literary types looks down upon her, it's upon her, down upon the institution of marriage, down upon her role in the home. And clearly she appears very far from any man's ideals. Um, so she's very unattractive. And the message here is the educated new woman is not a sweet girl, but very a very masculine, ugly spinster. So you can see from this presentation, I hope, um, what Gilman and other women writers, and men writers too of the time, were wrestling with. Some of the ideas, the contrast between the Victorian woman, the angel in the house, and the new woman and how this new woman was emerging in the culture. So as you go on to read about, um, as you go on to read the yellow wallpaper and read trifles later on, think about where in time um, the works were situated because it matters. It matters that Gilman was writing during this time period. Gives you a little insight into her writing and into the work. So think about that. Also, um, just a little background on Gilman herself. She um, was born in 1860. She died in 1935. She actually euthanized herself. She had inoperable breast cancer, and so she euthanized herself. As a woman, as a young woman, she um, suffered severe postpartum depression. And she went to see Weir Mitchell, who's mentioned in the story, who prescribed what was very common at that time called the rest cure, which basically meant isolation and confinement. And she was instructed um, to live as domestic a life as possible, limit her intellectual activity, and never touch pen or brush again. So she writes the yellow wallpaper in response to Weir Mitchell's um, prescription for her and she sends this story to him. So the story is about a woman suffering postpartum depression who is prescribed the rest cure and what happens to her. So you can see some of the commentary that Gilman is making not only to Dr. Mitchell but to the culture at large in the story.